You know, so, so it's, oh, this is a very emotional day for me, right? It's a, I mean, isn't it an emotional? I mean, this is a weird day. A lot going on, a lot of passion. We've tried very hard uh, to engage all sides of the debate. I remember that, that when we at The Atlantic felt very committed to bringing in an editorial platform to discuss LGBT issues. It's different than an advocacy platform. That means you have tough moments. I thought that we had made enormous strides in talking about the transgender community, bringing them in in previous forums. I feel so worried about this world. And I, Commander, you're the, the highest ranking transgender service member actively serving in the US military today. Talk me down, should I not be worried? <laughs> So, so a couple of things with that. One, I'm, I'm definitely not the highest ranking. Uh, well, we definitely have a few that outrank me. Just let me, me give you a promotion <laughs> win. So, yeah, yeah. So, Your mom uh, says you're going to be an admiral. Yeah, so. my, mo my mother thinks highly of me. Um, <laughs> probably hi more highly than I do of myself. Um, but there's definitely some uncertain times, right? However, for the most part, service members have been fully integrated and are most, for the most part, fully accepted. There are pockets obviously within the services where you have unsupportive commanders, mm -hmm. um, but those are a lot fewer than those that are being supported and working their way through their transition. There's some confusion with the policy, obviously, um, with regards to whether or not it's still in effect or who's, who's eligible, what, what you're eligible for, and, and things like that. Um, but that's not because the service members aren't supported. Mm. Um, everybody realizes the, the contributions that transgender service members make to the military, uh, not because they are trans, but because of the jobs that they're doing and the jobs that they're filling right now. So it is uncertain, but at the same time, our, our service members are continuing to, to succeed and, and really do well, now, especially now that they can do it openly. Were you surprised when Orrin Hatch and people like Congressman Ken Buck, I tried very hard to get Congressman Buck here, he's a Republican congressman from Colorado who just was robust in his support of transgender service. I think it's the only semi-progressive um, uh, syllables he's uh, uttered in a long time. He's sitting you know, out there, but I tried to get him hard to come over here, but, but he, he had a, a conflict. But were you surprised by the level of, you know, very surprising GOP support for, for you after the president's uh, tweets? Actually, I was. Um, that level of support comes with meeting trans service members. And that, that is, from my understanding, what happened with a lot of the Republican, service, the Republican congressmen right. that came out in support of us is that they've met service members that are transgender from their districts right. that are currently serving. The other thing, too, is understanding what the military does mm -hmm. and how removing service members who have done nothing wrong impacts overall unit readiness. Because now, now, I've got a, now I've got a gap that I have to fill right. that can't just be filled overnight. Mm. You know, there's training and, and preparations involved that bringing in a new person to fill that thing is. So and, that and, is big. And let me ask both you and Matt, and Shannon, you know, feel free to chime in anywhere here. Um, when I read the president's tweets that morning, I saw them immediately after he had put them up very early in the morning and, and saw this. I thought, wow, again, you know, I... I I don't know, uh, I'm not a transgender person, I'm not a service, but I thought, has he just created thousands of enemies within the military? I mean, do, do people feel, I mean, I wonder if this sometimes when, when the president was tweeting out the uh, anti-Muslim hate tweets the other day, um, whether or not within our, within our military ranks do we have people who no longer, do, are they able to separate Donald Trump and service of Donald Trump as commander in chief from their loyalty and concern for the United States? I'm, I'm going to hand that question over to Matt. Uh, that, that, is, that is beyond probably where I, yeah. I can legally speak uh, Matt, as a service Go member. for it. I mean, he is the commander-in-chief. Right. right. So he is, he is you, sa you say that so enthusiastically. <laughs> well, he's created thousands yeah. of enemies on yeah. his own, so yeah. we haven't had to provide any support there. Um, but, you know, he is, you know, the commander-in-chief. But I do think, you know, just the military is just a microcosm of the country, right? So yeah. You have individuals who, tend, you know, are conservative and you have those who are liberal. So, mm -hmm. you know, but the, the thing about the military is it's, it's you know, country first, uh, mission first. You know, that's what they're going to focus on. That's what they have been focused on. That's what they're going to do. Um, you know, I will say about the tweets that it is a massive disruption. Uh, it threw a whole bunch of chaos into into DOD, DOD is very regimented, and you know these are our missions, these are our goals, these are what we have to go out and accomplish. And it's hard to do that when you have a president that's 
you know, contradicting what you're actually trying to do or throwing, mm. you know, f potentially 15,000 people and saying, I'm going to throw you out. And to Blake's point, you know, you can't just kick individuals out and then expect people that are going to be ready to replace them. That's time and effort and education that has to go into getting those individuals ready for all of the levels of jobs that they're doing. Shannon, I know the National Center for Lesbian Rights is one of the litigants you've, you've filed uh, in these cases. I know there, there may be more, but I know that there are at least four uh, uh, cases that are being litigated right now. What's the status of those? And as I understand it, there was some controversy where people thought, say, hold up, don't, don't, don't take legal action yet. I don't get that uh, answer, but what is the logic in that debate and pressure that I know you've been facing over these cases? Yeah, no, thanks, Steve. Yeah, I think one of the things we've seen with this president repeatedly on this issue and other issues as well is he'll do something like take an action that is terribly harmful and then try to sow a lot of confusion and, and, and muddy the water so that people, rather than responding appropriately, just end up being confused. We, so that's that we did face that struggle with uh, the transgender military ban that, you know, Trump was very clear. He tweeted the tweets and then in short order followed up with a very official memorandum that instructed, ordered the military and he's commander in chief to reinstate the ban on transgender service members. But then the, but then the, they also have this PR machine that started saying, oh, nothing's really happening. You know, we're still, we're just looking at this policy. Meanwhile, there was a very clear presidential order and it confused people. It confused people even in our own community. But that's why um, NCLR and then I work with uh, Jennifer Levi, who's the trans, uh, the director of the Transgender Rights Project at uh, GLAAD, who I'm sure many people know from the Obergefell case. We just thought it was so important to not be hypnotized by this, you know, trick really into you know act so we filed a lawsuit you know right away but there are now four lawsuits in short order there were three others filed uh, Matt is an uh, outserve has a, a lawsuit with Lambda that's filed in Washington State the NCLR and GLAD case is in DC we actually have another case in California and then the ACLU has a case in Maryland and we got two rulings already the DC case and uh, the Maryland judge has already issued preliminary injunctions saying that at least for the moment, that Trump cannot enforce the ban. You know, a year ago when we held this, I had the privilege of interviewing Eric Fanning, who is wonderful man. Yep. So, former Secretary of the, or Secretary of the Army at that point, uh, Chuck Hagel, Secretary of Defense, had told me that if he could have, if he had, didn't have to get two nominations, and he would have made Eric Deputy Secretary of Defense. Um, and when Ash Carter uh, succeeded Chuck Hagel and came in. Um, moving transgendered service forward uh, in a big way. And I asked Eric on this stage a year ago, and some of you were here and remembered, I said, can these rights be rolled back? And he said, it can't happen. You just can't take rights away from people. Was Eric Fanning wrong? I hope not, and uh, you know we, we shall see. But you you asked this question about what you know what's the impact of Trump's statement on people in the military. This is extraordinary. This has never happened in our nation's history that a president has attacked individuals who are currently serving our country, including people who are deployed overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan, Korea. I mean, that is a shock to the system for, for everyone in the military. An attack on some service members is an attack on right. all service members. Matt, how do you feel? I don't think Eric was wrong. I think, you know, up until June, there, this was not, DOD had no desire to roll anything back. We had worked with the Armed Services Committee in the Senate during uh, now Secretary Mattis' confirmation hearing to get clarification on what he thought about our policies, uh, not just on trans service, but we pushed them on a few other things. And there was no indication from DOD at all that this was something that they had intended to, to go about. This strictly came uh, out of the West Wing, out of the White House, um, through a Twitter handle. Um, but I, you know, I don't think at that moment that Eric was wrong. It's not mm -hmm. something, you know, he has held so many different positions in DOD from Chief of Staff to Ash Carter to Secretary of the Army. You know, DOD's perspective is that they were gonna move forward and that they were going to roll and continue to do the job that they're instructed to do. So in that, in that perspective, no, I don't think Eric was wrong. Blake, I was really intrigued reading about your promotion ceremony. You're, I, maybe I have this part right, you're the first uh, out transgendered member of the military to be promoted. Correct. Uh, so th that's correct. Got something right there. Uh, congratulations. But what really intrigued me was when you were promoted, 
I know your par parents out there, I was reading about your grandmother having you know, driven a truck in World War II and then having been knocked out of the position because she was a woman. You know, so I know that these issues run very deeply in your family, uh, particularly about gender and service and whatnot. Um, but I was intrigued that every member on stage when you got promoted, every military member was a transgendered service member. Correct. So take us, take us, you know, give us that picture. And so how did that happen? as we were moving towards uh, designing the promotion, um, the implementation of the policy was was happening October first. But I I had been well out to to my command for well over a year, um, so I wanted to kind of make it meaningful because they knew that I'd been working this issue since I had I had been there, and I wanted to make it meaningful to me Can because I just it was my promotion interrupt, ceremony. But you were winner of the Navy League's Vice Admiral Robert F. Batchelder Award, the Navy's highest logistics award for contributing to the operational readiness of the fleet. Yes. Sounds really big, is it? <laughs> yes, it's uh, a big yes, deal. It's a big deal. It's a big uh, deal. It is the it is the the Navy's highest logistics award for junior officers. Uh, I did it for uh, I was awarded it for my work on submarines, mm -hmm. um, which I was also one of the first at the time female bodied personnel to integrate women on submarines in 2011. Um, I did five strategic deterrent patrols. Um, I've deployed 11 times, right? Everything that you could say about anything when it comes to transgender service, I've done it all, right? I, there, there is, I've, I've, I've had medical procedures while on operational duty, mm. you know, in ways that didn't impact my mission readiness or the unit readiness. I've done uh, consistent, always been ready to deploy, and uh, unit cohesion has never been an issue. Mm. So. Um, when it came to time to do my promotion, I wanted to make it meaningful for me because it was my promotion and I get to make those decisions. <laughs> so um, one of my closest friends happens to be, uh, at the time, Major uh, Bree Fram, mm -hmm. and uh, they will put on Lieutenant Colonel in January, um, <clears throat> and then Amanda Simpson, who also happens to be a mentor of mine, and I wanted her to do be my promoting officer. Mm. And so I made sure that you know, if I was going to make, if I was going to take time to take my ceremony and make a statement, uh, that was going to be what the statement was. And that was, hey, we're all here. We're already serving. We're already doing it honorably, and we're going to continue to do it. And that was, that was the message that I wanted to convey. Let me just add, thank, and congratulations. I mean, it was very powerful when I read, read, read that. You know, I don't think we've ever had so much clapping at an Atlantic <laughs> Forum before. Uh, it's Wait, making me nervous. Yeah. It does. You know, uh, but, but it, 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 it I feel like, in a way, this is a feel-good story so far, and I just feel like most of the transgender story is not a feel-good story, that there are real stresses and strains. I know that you're litigating cases. I know that you're dealing with real-life crises uh, out there among some of your members. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, to get beyond the military and the, these issues, as you look around communities, you, uh, you said something very important to me, uh, like, which was that unit readiness was not impacted and that your relations with your colleagues are there. But when you step out of some of these zo zones, are, are you able to, to influence the way the broader community feels about inclusion and acceptance and embrace of, of transgendered uh, citizens? Well, I, I mean, I think DOD has, you know, not just on LGBT issues, but right. has been ahead of the curve with the country as a whole. There was, it, the DOD desegregated the force before we had the Civil right. Rights Act. Um, you know, now we have women in combat and uh, we repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and now we have open transgender service. You know, I think it has a te it has had a tendency, to, or the military has had a tendency of kind of leading ahead of, of the country and helping the country kind of come along with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Blake and Shannon. Well, part of that happens to be that military service members are, um, based on the most recent Gallup polls, the most trusted job in the country, right? So when you talk about whether you're gay, you're straight, you're or black or white or whatever. Mm -hmm. People trust your judgment as a military service member. And um, being trans, that brings forward, hey, I can do those types of things. I'm not limited in my ability. I may not choose to join the military, mm -hmm. but I'm not limited in what I can achieve. And that brings forth the idea that ever, you know, not everybody knows uh, a trans person, but they might know a service member. And um, that service member likely knows a trans service member who they can interact with and come to an understanding for, and that understanding is what changes hearts and minds. Thank you. Um, Shannon and, and, and uh, Matt, before I go to the audience or questions, 
if if we were to get you're both in civil society, you're you're advocating institutions, and I'm interested for you to achieve more of what you want to achieve. And we gave you um, the power to move a needle, the power to do uh, something extraordinary uh, uh, to move the rights agenda uh, forward. What do you most need? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, I mean, but to go back to, you know, uh, uh, our friend from Log Cabin, Republicans, isn't it important to have the Republicans on board? I mean, that's why I asked about Orrin Hatch, Ken Buck, I some mean, of these others. But I mean, absolutely. I mean, like, we've had, you know, John McCain has right. sponsored legislation uh, with Kirsten Gillibrand. Uh, you know, we do have Republicans on board. The problem is, is the, quite frankly, the leadership in both chambers mm. and, the, and the White House. There is no desire to move. We have two pieces of legislation that are sitting in the House and the Senate right now mm. to uh, basically codify open transgender service and protect mm. trans service members. You know, where's Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell on moving that legislation forward? You know, like we have Orrin Hatch and we have Republicans that want to, that are with us. Well, then mm. the leadership needs to, you know, recognize that this is a bipartisan issue now and. Mm. They need to bring the legislation forward. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we need greater public education and support, but what transgender people need is just the chance to contribute and participate. I mean, you see what happens, and you see amazing individuals like Blake and these other transgender service members I am, like, so honored to represent. They're extraordinary people. That is what's so powerful. Exactly what you said, Blake. The military is one of the few employers in our country that actually can... When they, did, when they make a decision to get rid of some artificial barrier and let some previously marginalized group be integrated into the service, they do it, and they know how to do it. And th that is the silver lining to this whole miserable fiasco that we're in right now, is our whole country is getting to know people like Blake and other transgender service members. And my hope is that it is going to actually transform the way our country sees transgender people more generally. I, I don't mean this in any uh, facetious way, and so I'm maybe stepping on a land. Did Caitlyn Jenner help this process or hurt it? I, I would call it a neutral party. Neutral? I, because, I mean, in all honesty, nobody in the military is going to listen to anything Caitlyn Jenner says. <laughs> so, um, so it, it, I mean, it, that, that may be true, but when you're talking military policy, they want to yeah. hear from military, right. like military veterans or military people, people who have served in the past and things like that. I think it was so, true, quite frankly, for transgender rights as a whole, uh, if you take like the, right. you know, the, our whole movement and focusing on transgender rights, it was the silver lining out of those tweets was Blake and the cadre of individuals that we had on CNN and MSNBC mm. because that picture needs to be painted. Right. I, you know, Caitlyn Jenner can do what Caitlyn Jenner wants to do. But their work and what mm. they're doing, that has advanced That's powerful. far more than Caitlyn Jenner has. Shannon? Yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. I you know, I want people to see the public to see people like Blake and the other plaintiffs in these cases and just transgender service members, yeah. Oh, I think it's great. Uh, let me open up the floor. Qu questions, comments. We've got one right back here. Do we have a mic, folks? Where's the mic? Oh, we have one here. Sorry there. Um, I'm going to get to you. So, yes. Hi, uh, Sue. Hi, Sue Fulton. Um, uh, organization, Women in the Service Change Initiative. Um, so I understand people view senior military officers, admirals, and generals as being very hidebound and very conservative. Can you talk a little bit about their reaction? Obviously, they met transgender service members during this process, and and um, you know, what are they are they are they being dragged through this? Like, what's been their reaction? It's great. So our senior military leaders have been supportive throughout this process. Now they didn't start out that way in many cases. Mm. And part of that had to do with the lack of education on what transgender meant and what it meant to transition in service. So as um, people like myself and others that we brought in, whether we were talking to company commanders, um, infantry, um, infantrymen, submariners like myself, um, and drill sergeants and things like that to meet with those senior leaders to help them understand these are the people that you have. They're not some anomaly. They're doing the jobs that you need to be done. Um, that definitely moved the needle into our favor. And the, the sudden issues with the policy have forced many of them to make sta public statements in support because they're not interested in politics. They're interested in the people that are doing what they're doing. 
Great, thank you. Yes. She'll hold the mic for you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Joanne Fisher. Do not, do not discredit Ms. Jenner. I am a veteran, and I want you to know she made a difference in the veteran community. There is no question, a statement. She made a difference in the veteran community for transgenders because of what she went through. She got 90% disability. When you come out, you come see us. I'm with the Joint Veterans Commission. I'm with all kinds of veteran organizations. We get you money for any kind of backlash. So that was it. So I'm thank, sorry. Thank you for your perspective. I appreciate it. Because I am interested in, in, in how people are perceived in this world because we deal a lot with experiences, symbols, what's in the media. And, and I'm interested in, in those things that resonate uh, to move this forward. And again, I feel um, like this is a fragile time. So I'm, I'm very happy uh, to see the gains you've all made. Yes, right here. Yep. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm with the government of Quebec. And I'm just wondering, the United States has many military allies. The majority of NATO countries do allow trans service. I think they're 18, Some, 18 right? 18, 18 uh, is correct. Nations. Yeah, so how has, number one, the, deci the recent decisions of the United States military impacted your relations with NATO allies, and before, uh, even Obama's uh, decision to allow trans other nations had, has, is there a solidarity between the trans service members of NATO countries? Is there uh, any lo lobbying on their parts? Right. Blake? Um, so when the DOD did the original study, they did study the 18 allies that we um, partner with as far as how they did open transgender service. RAND was very adamant about using those experiences in their study. Um, whether or not this particular issue is going to damage uh, NATO allies, um, this is not the issue that's going to do that. Matt? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah, I, th well, I think well the decision well, today well, about so, yeah. I think the decision today about Jerusalem that has a bigger impact on on uh, some of those countries. But you know, uh, you mentioned the Obama administration. You know, this was a DoD-led policy. Um, DOD implemented this. Yes, it was Ash Carter, and he served under President Obama. But this wasn't a, this this decision was DOD led. Uh, this was not imposed on them by the the Obama administration. Um, the Obama administration just allowed them to develop this policy and come together and implement it on their. On Shannon, their own. does this issue of al uh, of not necessarily relation with allies, but the experience of allies that have open transgender service and who have great success with it. Does that influence the court cases that you're pursuing? Absolutely. And how you're framing them? Absolutely, yes. Uh, as Blake noted, that was a key part of the RAND study that the military itself right. commissioned and they looked at the experience, now the lengthy experience, extensive experience of other countries that have long had open service by transgender people and help them reach the conclusion that it would be absolute, there's absolutely no reason not to do the same in, in the U.S. And yes, the, the judges that we're in front of in these federal lawsuits, mm -hmm. you can bet that we're calling that to their attention. And uh, Judge Kotar Catelli, who issued the first PI and preliminary injunction in, uh, right here in uh, the district, uh, noted that in her opinion. I, uh, Go ahead. Really quick, Steve. I would also say I think that some of those countries are probably looking at us like, WTF, like, what are you guys doing? Um, you know, so I think that play, you know, like, we're, this, as the United States, and not just on this issue, but on a number of issues, we're, we're ceding our leadership to, to some of these other countries. A lot of what TF moments, or, yeah, uh, yeah WTF. Uh, do we have one more question? There, yes. Um, I can't hold the mic myself, apparently, but I will ask a question. Sorry, my it's my rule. Um, <laughs> thank you, it's not her rule. Um, I'm Jim Forat. I come from 1969, the Gay Liberation Front, and I'm active in Rise and Resist and Gays Against Guns currently. I'd just like to step back for a moment. First of all, I want to say that everyone is entitled to work in the job that they're qualified for. Mm. That's my position. But this, this, this romance of military, which I hear over and over these days, is something that deeply troubles me coming from the politics that I do. Mm. And the whole question of binary identification rather than breaking the binary and, and the gender, those are questions that I just want to throw out into the floor. I'm not asking any of you to ask, answer me on that, but I think they have to be a part of the conversation. Thank you very much. So the question I think is, 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 is an interesting one, which is do, do I, I guess, Blake, this is towards you and then also your members in, in OutServe, is there a, uh, how do you feel about military service? I mean, this is one of the things where I think a lot of times 
that I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the 60s community came out during the period of the Vietnam War, protest in some ways against the state, concern about being directed. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of change and fragmentation and, you know, the, and evolution. But I'm interested in whether this is something that is discussed among your members. Um, we definitely have a cross-section of, of political views amongst even just the transgender military community and within the, the gay community as far as, um, you know, the idea behind um, the romanticization of, of military service as, as was put. Um, we also have um, across the binary or across the spectrum of gender represented within the military. Right. Um, the military doesn't necessarily care that you're somewhere on the spectrum as long as you s show up to work in uniform in box A or box B based on what's in the paperwork. Um, and transgender, open transgender military service gave you the opportunity to switch the boxes. But as far as falling onto the spectrum, they absolutely don't really care about that as long as, again, you show up to work in either box A or box B. Um, right. And you don't cross that without going through a process. So, um, and that part is because the military is very regimented and we're not, as a culture, not ready for gender neutral standards as far as um, physical fitness standards or um, military uniform standards. It's, it's not something that we're ignoring, but we also realize at what point we can move forward and push the military in a certain direction and right. when we can't. And right, right. now, that we're still trying to get them to understand that you can switch boxes, much less right. um, yeah. move them across the spectrum. Shannon, any quick thoughts? Well, I just want to say I think there's a big difference between U.S. militarism, which has caused a lot of damage right. in the world, and the members of the U.S. military who are generally wonderful, dedicated people who do really hard jobs and do lots of different things. Uh, <laughs> including, I mean, all the dis natural disasters that we've had recently in this country. Who do you, that's who's right. on the scene there right. hel helping, helping folks. And the other thing I would right. say about that is that that's why this, this case and this issue is so important. It's so critical that we hold the military accountable to democratic principles and to be accountable to our constitution. That will help the military be a more pro progressive, constructive institution. Matt, last word. I, you know, I grew up in a military family and I think there's, you know, a big, a lot of the country has a misconception that, you know, the military is about going to war and stuff like that. You know, a lot of times, you know, to Shannon's point, mm -hmm. you know, they're the first ones on, on the scene in natural disasters through our National Guards and our Army Corps of Engineers and others who get deployed. Um, and quite frankly, they're, you know, the military is all about diplomat, you know, before we even get to, you know, a war effort, uh, you know, it's all about getting things done diplomatically. Um, or as, as much as we possibly can. Um, and, and I, you know, finally, I think military service or, you know, through the Peace Corps civil service is something that all Americans should really strongly take a look at. You know, the military is not for everyone. Um, there are other civil service options, but I think service in general is a, is a, good, uh, a good thing for this country. Thank you. I just wanted to make an editorial comment of my own about this um, because I feel like it's so important. First of all, I want to th say thank you to, to all of you for what you're doing here. And, and I would say with regard to service in the military is I, I was in uh, uh, ROTC, in the uh, uh, Air Force ROTC in, in, in college, and I left because I knew if I signed that second year paper with my scholarship, I would be at that point violating the law, put myself in real jeopardy and doing things. And, and it's always bothered me. And, and I have, from my experience of having you know, whether it's the health community or the financial community or first responders or the U.S. military or protest groups uh, that are concerned about like, any gun activists. You know, when you look at the LGBTQ uh, concerns that we have here, among many people have this, the fact is there are LGBTQ participants in every single one of those communities. And so I would say whether it's national service or whether it's protesting things the country does, uh, there's an LGBTQ DNA element into that and everything. So that'll be my editorial comment. Thank you so much, uh, Blake. Uh, get this right, Blake Demon, of the president of Sparta, and thank you for Sparta. Shannon Minter of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and Matt Thorne of Outserve SLDN. Thank, thank you, you all so much. Thanks. Thank you.